Um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Tom Butler from the Clean Energy Council and uh, I think give credit to, to Tom and the hard work that he's done in this sector for what is now probably a couple of years. Uh, and I guess really today is the, the result of, of all of that hard work and uh, Tom indeed will, uh, will introduce and provide some context for the work. Over you, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Karen, and thanks everyone for coming um, to the session today, and Danny as well for the overview there from Marina. Um, a bit of context, and uh, Karen's about right. For the last three years, we've been working on this project, and um, with funding from Marina, uh, supporting it as well. But we call it the uh, FPDI project for short. There's a lot to that. There's a lot of context. If I go into the detail, I'm not going to do that. But there's a number of facets in this work, and really the project's aims are to work with the industry and work to achieve outcomes that enhance the flexibility and resilience of the electricity distribution sector um, across the industry. So one of those key areas is on storage, and um, this is an overview of the whole project, but uh, storage crosses over two parts. One's the, the hardware or the kit and the standards around the kit and the installation, and the other one's consumers and information for consumers. So through the CSIRO study, we tried to address both those areas where we've engage CSIRO, who's the, the leading research agency in Australia in this field, um, to look at the two parts and look at the, the safety requirements of battery installations and the, the gaps in standards. And, uh, and then to move on to you know, what kind of safety information do consumers need and you know, what's, what can be done on, this, on the consumer side of things. So there's the two, the two facets there. Um, look, I'm not going to talk any more on it, but go to our website if you want more information on the project and it's all there. There's, heaps and heaps of reports we've put out in the last year or so. So um, without going any further, I'll hand over to uh, Sam Behrens from CSIRO to, to talk on the, uh, the report we've released today. Thanks, Tom. Welcome, everyone. It's all good. OK, excellent. Thank you. Oh, OK, excellent. Um, so just a little bit about myself before we get into the actual uh, project. So I'm a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer. Uh, I've been with CSIRO for about 10 years and I've been working across a range of different areas within CSIRO, uh, specifically in storage. So I now lead the storage component or the integration of storage in CSIRO. Uh, there is other storage technology that's been developed um, elsewhere within CSIRO. So we mostly look at the integration side of things and we also look at making these things as well. So some of you may be familiar with the ultra battery. We developed that about 10 years or so. So the study is uh, the storage safety performance study. Uh, it's been going for about six months. Um, I lead that. There's obviously about five or six other colleagues. Kate Cabernet is up the back. Cabernet, sorry, is up the back. Um, we all have a range of different expertise. Um, oops, my mistake. Expertise uh, in chemistry, um, engineering, uh, myself, obviously engineering, project management, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but what I would like to quickly go through is just how the actual project um, outline for today is. So I'm just going to go quickly through the project scope, methodology, uh, the key findings, and also the recommendations and the conclusions. Um, Tom and, and, and others have actually sort of given most of the, the context of the actual uh, project, uh, so I won't try and dwell on it too much, but um, so obviously we were commissioned by the Clean Energy Council to do this project. Uh, it's part of the Future Proofing in Australia's Distribution Industry uh, project, which was funded by ARENA. Um, obviously the project has other stakeholders as well, which we also consulted, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, there's a web link there that you're, if, you're, if you're interested. With regards to the the um, the uh, roadmap that we saw previously, um, we actually are relevant for number two and three. Um, obviously, uh, it spans across uh, basically educating uh, consumers and then also uh, understanding the safety implications of this. So the project outline uh, basically was to give an expert advice 
about uh, best practice for energy storage safety systems. Um, and that included products. Uh, so that product might be a system that actually has an inverter um, coupled together with some storage, so a box like a Tesla system. Um, or it might be a system where you have components that you actually bring together and wire them up and make a system complete. Um, the particular project uh, basically was to look at the market conditions and the standards uh, and look at what's actually happening out there, uh, try and get as much information as possible, talk to the industry and try and collate that together uh, and get a good understanding about what was happening in the domestic and small commercial scale uh, installations. Uh, we limited the scope between uh, one kilowatt hour up to 200 kilowatt hours, uh, mainly because of some of the work that the Clean Energy Council was working on in the standards area. So there's two major components of the project. Uh, Tom's sort of briefly touched on it before. Uh, so there was a technical report, uh, which is roughly about an 80 page document, which goes in the really, really fine detail. Um, I won't go into the real detail today. It'll be more of a high level overview of the actual project. Um, and then there was also the other component as well, which was the uh, consumer guide, which is basically a, you know, something that a consumer can read and get a good understanding about what they need to do um, for themselves when they actually install these systems, as well as installers and stuff as well. So CSR used an approach of um, first going and doing a literature review. So we spent probably about three months trolling through all the different um, you know, journal conference publications that are out there, um, locally in Australia and also internationally. Uh, we also looked at national and international reports as well too. You can see some of them on the right hand side. Uh, also looked at national and international standards and codes, and they include building codes as well. Uh, and even the marine industry as well as aviation stuff as well. Um, we looked at online magazines and literature and had a look at what people were talking about. Um, and we also used our in-house in knowledge. Um, so CSRO is actually inventor of the ultra battery. Uh, we've also done some large installations there with the Hampton Wind Farm, which was basically a one megawatt uh, wind turbine coupled with about one megawatt hour of um, storage. And we actually did some smoothing on that. Uh, we've also got uh, some studies that we did with AMO and also with AMC, uh, which we built on as well. And we've actually, just a little bit of a plug for ourselves, we've actually just commissioned a, a fairly large lithium ion phosphate system, which is on the right hand side, which is a BYD system. And um, Kate is the project manager of that. Um, and obviously we've learnt lots of things about installing that system. So we've got a bit of an understanding about how to actually install these. <laughs> um, obviously there are a lot of processes just to go through to install it in New South Wales. Um, We've also got some residential systems as well. We've got three or four different types. We've got some installations also in Canberra as well too. So we're actually using those particular tools to, um, as research platforms, but also to uh, do some peak shaving as well for our particular site in the Energy Centre in Newcastle. Um, so before, oh, after the interview process, we actually did, uh, sorry, after the um, uh, literature search, we went through and we actually spoke to 24 um, key uh, installers and suppliers of these storage systems. Um, we asked them a one-on-one -on -one sort of conversation about, you know, you know, what's what's the sort of what do you do from you know when you buy these systems? Um, how do you transport it? How do you handle it? How do you design it? Um, what do you do at the end of it? And we asked them a whole bunch of really sort of you know really um, I suppose personal questions as well uh, about. You know, what do you guys do? Because there's obviously people that are actually installing these things out in the field. We also asked them about their safety issues as well too. Um, have they actually experienced anything? Had they, um, you know, had they seen any incidents at all? Maybe you know something falling off the back of a truck or something like that, or being punched mechanically somehow. And we used that information from those 24 um, interviewees, and we actually um, went out and developed a more comprehensive survey and we actually did some focus group study work where we basically extended on, on, on those interviews and uh, we spoke to uh, five different groups mainly from um, sort of Brisbane and northern New South Wales and uh, each one of those groups I think had about 20 individuals in it and they were from um, installers, consumers, general public as well 
And we asked them a whole range of different questions uh, about um, you know, extending on what we actually asked before in the interviews. And we took that information and we used that um, to basically help us draft up our technical report and also uh, a draft consumer guide. Um, we also, uh, with that, um, the way we staggered the actual uh, focus groups, we actually were able to test our consumer guide with some of the focus groups in uh, Coffs Harbour. And we then used that to refine our particular consumer guide. We also tested it with our senior research scientists and also subject experts. Um, so some of the guys down there in um, Clayton CSIRO uh, who actually build these things, we asked them about their thoughts about certain things as well. And then we basically gave that those documents to, uh, um, so the report and the guide to the Clean Energy Council. It went through a review process with the uh, FPDI steering committee. It also went through CSI, uh, CEC storage integrity working groups. And they actually looked over it and it also went through some of the uh, focus groups as well too. Um, we then got some feedback about our particular publications and our, um, comp uh, our consumer guide. And we then used that to basically refine our final reports and our findings. Um, I should mention that the storage integrity group members consisted of quite a few people from industry, from uh, the Clean Energy Council, uh, SMA, Sunverge, CSIRO, Fire and Rescue New South Wales, uh, Excide, AGL, they're just some of them. So there were quite a few people from different industries. Um, and same with the uh, FPDI steering committee as well too. We obviously had CC, CSR was on the AGL, um, uh, ARENA, uh, uh, Electronet, uh, I think that's right, no, Osnet services. Um, so there's a whole range of different individuals there. If you want more information, I can let you know after the presentation. So some of the observations we found, so this is just sort of some general observations going through the literature and also talking to industry as well. We found there's a wide range of different technologies, uh, ranging from the traditional lead acid, which has been around for a long period of time. Um, lithium is obviously the hot topic at the moment, especially with the way things are moving uh, with uh, particular companies. Um, we also found that nickel-based uh, type um, battery systems as well also to be popular, uh, flow batteries and also this new one, which is a sodium analogue. Um, which is effectively a salt water battery, um, which is claimed to be uh, almost 100% recyclable. So obviously each one of these different technologies has its advantages and disadvantages and they have different uh, levels of maturity. Um, obviously, you know, for example, you'll probably find that lithium ion batteries can provide pretty good peak power, um, where maybe the sodium analogue doesn't provide that power, but more of an energy type base, similar to the flow battery as well. Um, each one of these different technologies has its own unique um, you know, performance and also safety challenge and uh, we had to consider that as part of this particular report. So some of the key findings we found. Um, so number one, we found that there was a lack of knowledge on the variety of energy storage technologies and thus how to care for them and operate them in a safe manner in domestic and small commercial scale systems. Um, I know that battery systems are a fairly low, low risk technology, but it's important that they are installed and maintained by an accredited staller um, and that their industry best practices also developed. Um, finding two, um, there's currently no consensus on the appropriate method to extinguish a lithium ion battery fire in the event of an incident. Um, so we actually looked and talked to quite a few chemists about this. Um, also out, outside CSR and internally. Um, obviously, you know, in particular, lithium is a, you know, it's great technology, but, you know, if it's not handled well, it, it can actually have some properties there where it might actually catch on fire. Um, and it also has this unique thing called thermal runaway. Um, so we looked at different approaches about how to actually put that out. Um, there was no real consensus on that. Um, and I can talk a little bit about that later. There is also, so point three, uh, key finding. Uh, there is insufficient accreditation and training to support and provide, uh, qualifi sorry, provide qualifications for designers and installers of energy storage systems. So that was across all of Australia. That's one of the findings that we found. Um, obviously there needs to be a, um, you know, 
this needs to be addressed soon, especially with the lithium ion systems that are currently coming on the market. Um, you know, people need to be trained up in those particular spaces and those particular chemistries and also, you know, simple things like putting right safety protocols and also relevant so uh, signs and warning signs about what type of chemistry it is. Um, that can be very useful for particular, um, you know, fire brigades or something like that down the, down the track if there's an incident. So key findings number five. Um, so emergency response teams have limited education about the issues related to energy storage technologies in the event of an incident. So, uh, you know, if there is an actual an event, um, fire brigade will come on site, they'll look at it and go, okay, what shall I do? Um, and there is no real clear, um, you know, technique for actually extinguishing these things. So there's methods of putting sand on it, um, using liquid nitrogen, um, basically running away. Um, uh, <laughs> so there is no real clear understanding about how you deal with that. And that's not just in this industry, it's also in the electric vehicle industry as well too. So um, that's just an observation. Um, with point six, uh, there's a lack of standards for battery storage uh, disposal and recycling. Obviously lead acid is an exception to that. Um, roughly 90% of our lead acid battery can be recycled. Um, there is a good process in place. It's, you know, it's working really well, but for lithium, there is nothing, um, there isn't anything for the nickel based, uh, sorry, the uh, flow batteries or even um, the uh, nickel based type batteries as well too. Um, I know that at the moment they're just collecting them, and storing them in a warehouse and then maybe shipping them overseas for recycling. I should point out that roughly 50% or 50 to 60% of that lithium ion battery or those type of batteries can actually be recovered, the raw metals. Um, so it's not as much as what the lead acid battery is, but you can still use most of the particular metals, especially things like cobalt and uh, all the heavy metals that are in it. Um, number seven, so Australian standards um, for battery energy storage uh, obviously um, are lacking and there needs to be more um, there needs to be more standards in the connection and electrical. It's obviously, so at the moment it's very incomplete. Um, obviously people are working on that, it's a slow system. Uh, hopefully we can try and address some of that fairly soon and I think we are, um, but it's, it's, it is a slow process. And then the last one is stationary energy storage installations and incidences are inefficiently reported. So, um, you know, one thing would be really great um, is to have some sort of database similar to what we do with solar. Uh, so that people are aware what type of chemistry is actually on a particular site. Um, if there is an incident, um, it's also good for uh, other things such as the environmental impacts as well too. So just a little bit of a graphical summary about what we found. Um, we did actually choose uh, five different technologies just to have a bit of a gap analysis of. Um, and we looked at lead acid, uh, lithium, nickel based flow and sodium analogue. We also, along the top there, I have to apologise, it's sort of on an angle, if you tilt your head the right way, you'll be able to read it, but it says um, consumer education, best practice, designer accreditation, installation accreditation, technology standards. Uh, there's also uh, installation standards, so technology is obviously the chemistry of the particular battery and then the install is more of the wiring, electrical side of things. And then the reporting maintenance and incident reporting, and then warranties, and then on the far end, on the far right there, we have a recycling disposal. So um, we've used a traffic light type system here. So basically a green tick is, uh, it is effective. And then uh, obviously with an, or an orange, uh, with an O in it, it's partially effective. And then a red with a cross is obviously ineffective. So you can see that the lead acid battery <coughs> across the board is pretty good, um, obviously, um, there is a few things there with regards to reporting where these particular systems are installed uh, and that needs to be addressed in some sort of database we think. Um, there's also the warranties as well uh, and I should point out the warranties for all the different battery technologies um, that you know if you read the fine print in the actual warranty you'll find that that particular chemistry uh, sorry, the particular system has to be cycled at a certain rate, you know, once a day. It has to be maintained at maybe 25 degrees. And, you know, there's some very strict type of, um, you know, parameters that you have to stay in to actually not void that warranty. If you go outside that particular uh, those particular parameters, then your, your warranty is not void, uh, valid anymore. 
So that was just an observation we found. We actually talked to a couple of insurance companies as well too um, with regards to that because they were quite interested in, in this sort of space, especially around the warranty side. And um, yeah, they were interested in that. Um, so lithium, obviously people are aware about it. Uh, everyone's pretty, pretty across, you know, everyone's got one in their pocket. Um, so you know, consumers are pretty aware about it, but obviously they're not very aware about uh, best practice with these particular technologies. Um, and then all across the board in with recycling on the end. Um, and then the others were, had sort of similar sort of messages as well. Um, a lot of uh, consumers aren't really across, you know, what a sodium analogue uh, or a flow battery, or they may know a little bit about nickel-based type batteries like um, nickel metal hydrides, um, but it is pretty um, unique to them. So, I'll just go into the recommendations. Um, so the first recommendation we we think needs to occur is we need to improve the awareness of and access to inform or inform a variety of battery energy storage technologies and their appropriate operation and care among consumers, designers and installers. So that was a general message that we got talking with people and also what we found in the literature as well. Um, now obviously, you know, there is some general understanding about these particular systems. Uh, there's a lot of marketing that's going on. Um, People are aware about it, but probably getting a bit caught up in the hype. Um, that's some of the things that we found. Number two um, is research and identify the best method for lithium-ion battery storage system recycling and establish a lithium-ion battery recycling initiative. So I think that's going to be very critical in the early stages. I mean, obviously, I've mentioned before um, that lithium batteries do have a lot of... Uh, um, contain heavy and toxic metals uh, such as nickel, cobalt, cadmium and lead. Um, but obviously if we can try and get those then, uh, then we won't have any issues with the environment and also for persons as well too. So the third one is research and identify the best method to safely extinguish domestic and small commercial scale lithium ion battery systems. So you know, like I said before, there's basically um, a lack of understanding about what is the best way of doing this. So like I said, there's sand and liquid nitrogen, even the water mist. Um, there's another one, another technique which a lot of people wouldn't have in their fridge would be um, lithium chloride, which is basically just a salt, um, which would be, you know, if you're a chemist, that's what you probably would use, but most people don't have that. Um, fire foam. Um, and the other one is just do nothing. So it's very, you know, people, are, it's very unclear about what to do about that. Um, obviously CSR has some skills in that space. We may be able to help in some way to develop some technique to do that. Um, recommendation four. Align Australian and international standards to improve local regulation sorry, regulatory, and building codes relevant for energy storage systems. Um, just a little bit of context about that. We actually tried to install a lithium ion, so a domestic lithium ion storage system in one of our sites in Canberra. And we were advised that we had to put this in a particular bunker. Uh, so that's basically, you know, away from the house, away from the building, put it in a box, basically away from anyone. And it had to be in its own little room with ventilation and all this sort of stuff. Um, that's not really practical for a lot of domestic um, installations. Uh, I know it's completely different when you go across the border to New South Wales, um, but um, that's one thing that really needs to be worked on um, is with regards to that. And obviously, if you have to build a bunker at each person's house, that's going to add additional cost as well. So we don't want that either. Um, so number five, establish a set of best practices specifically for battery storage industry and include and develop the upkeep of an Installation, maintenance and incident reporting database um, for energy storage systems in Australia. So if we can have some sort of, you know, I know that there are installers that are currently going out there installing these particular systems. Uh, they may have their own database of where, you know, what particular system they actually installed. Um, but it would be really nice to have that as, as a, uh, a national database, especially if, if you know, say for example, a particular company that was originally there installed it and went out of business, um, who's going to do the maintenance on that on the next round? Um, so they need to have some sort of database. Um, and the last one is to develop training and national recognised accreditation pathways for designers and installers specifically for energy storage 
for domestic and small commercial scales. So that's obviously a very critical one. Um, it does take time to do that, but uh, you know we've got CC in the room here and, and a few others who are working in this space, and I think that needs to, to occur as well, and the team believes that. So that's sort of getting to the end of my presentation. I just wanted to briefly thank um, Arena for funding the uh, F PDI, <laughs> I have to get use all these acronyms, um, and also for the Clean Energy Council, so Tom and Sandy, uh, and others as well too, for helping us out on a particular projects, especially with all the graphics and stuff as well, it's been really great. i uh, also like to thank some of our colleagues, Dr John Ward and Tim Moore, um, with the actual work. also like to thank the FPDI uh, uh, Steering Committee and also the Storage Working Group, Integrity Working Group as well, and also industry members sorry, industry members, uh, the interviewees, the focus groups, and also the general public for their, their feedback. It's been greatly appreciated. So thank you very much. <laughs> Stand up here. Shall we sit down? Yeah, we've actually got time for questions. So um, do you want to open up the questions? Yeah, is there any questions Sam? at all? Yes. Um, we didn't look at that. Uh, we didn't think that was going to be... Oh. We looked at what the different technologies were there. We think that um, at this stage it's probably... You know, techni technically, it's probably not there yet. Um, you know, I, I personally wouldn't want to have one of those systems in my house yet because um, they're still trying to understand how these things work. But uh, obviously we looked across things that were basically available in the market. So that's what we looked at. Is there any other questions at all? I'd yes. like to ask if you call out where you're from. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Too, please. That'd be yep. great. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Rob Coe from Morgan Stanley. Yes. Um, just interested, you mentioned one of the stakeholders you've developed with is insurance companies. And uh, just if you can share what the feedback was from them. So we actually, <laughs> we actually looked over a couple of insurance policies, <laughs> about 12 of them, and there was only one that actually commented on batteries. Um, so we were just interested, you know, sort of, trying to figure out what people were thinking, especially in that sort of space. Um, and yeah, that's what we found anyway. It doesn't really mean anything, but um, we just had a look at that. So they're, they're starting to become aware about it, um, but they don't really know how to evaluate the risk, if that's, that's sort of the message we got from them. Yeah, I, I think they haven't actually got it in their models, their risk models yet, yeah. and I think they probably will in some way. So uh, it's probably a little bit out of the scope of the actual project, but we scientists do actually have that data, and I'd be happy to talk about it after the presentation. Sure. That's fine. Thank yeah. Could probably also mention that um, one of our other projects that we're supporting with the University of Adelaide yep. um, actually looks at a variety of battery chemistries and, and we're testing on that one. So there's been, um, and one of their purposes was to publish all of that data. Yeah. 
Yeah, so just had a comment there. So CSR is also doing some tests as well. So we've got um, facilities down in Clayton where we're able to um, effectively cycle um, electrically the particular battery chemistry. So we've got some lithium, some vanslate acids, some um, different types of lithium. Um, we're hoping to get a flow battery maybe, or maybe the, one of the aqua energy type battery systems to test. But we've actually got an environmental chamber as well too, so we can actually cycle it temperature-wise as well as humidity oh, okay. yeah. to see how these systems work. Um, so we're currently evaluating that at the moment. We're even debating about possibly getting doing NADA accreditation for some of those systems as well too. So that'd be quite useful, I think. Yes. So there's mixed messages across. So you'll look at one standard, it'll say you must use sand, and if you look at another standard, you'll say you must use, you know, dry powder. Um, so there's no consensus across standards, um, so they're conflicting each other. Um, and also, um, the scientists, call it that, um, are unsure about what you should actually use. I know in lab bench type experiments, so they actually just pour sand on it because it's so small. But if you want to try and pour sand on the side of the house, it's pretty impractical. And also, you get this thing like thermal runaway as well too, um, which is in, you know, you don't want that to happen. Uh, basically, the thing will explode. So, yeah, there's, inconsens uh, there's no senses there about that. And then the other question, sorry, just what was it again? It was the... Uh, how, how oh, the with regards to risk. With other appliances and gadgets around yeah, so... It's not part of the actual study that we actually went through and did a risk analysis and did a ASOP on it or whatever. Um, we didn't actually do that. I do actually have my own back of the envelope type calculations and I think it's a pretty low risk. I can explain, talk to you a little bit about it later, um, how I got to those. Um, but, you know, in my opinion, <laughs> I think that probably floor heaters are probably going to be more of a risk than having a lithium ion system on the side of your house blow up, to be honest, my opinion. No, no, because not that the product is not faulty, it's just the people around it that actually cause that heater to make the house catch on fire. So, yeah. Will the measure from the MRI. Um, lithium ion technology is split between a cobalt based and uh, a phosphate. phosphate. Lithium ion phosphate, yep. Um, is there any intention to distinguish them for firefighting purposes or yeah, well that, separation? Yeah, I mean, I, that's one of the recommendations. I think it would be really great if you could have one sticker to say this is a lithium ion phosphate and here's a blah 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 lithium type battery system because um, there is no there these things are different um, chemistry wise you know they might have lithium in them um, but when you actually put different chemistries on them to actually try and combat the fire then they react so um, really depends what type it is uh, and therefore it needs to be labeled appropriately so does that make sense I think it needs to happen in some way. Yeah, so um, just to clarify, so um, what we actually did was we tried to find a database across Australia which actually reported different types of lithium on fire. At the moment, there is none. Um, there is some stuff that it's actually in the um, in the US with uh, FFA, so FAA, that's right, um, which is the aviation, so it's similar to CASA um, in the US where they actually report lithium ion fires. We actually don't have that yet in Australia for aviation yet, um, but they are working on it. Um, so there needs to be some sort of database on it. I don't know, you know, for this particular industry, there probably needs to be something there, but as a battery industry, there probably needs to be something there as well, possibly. I don't know. Yes? Um, no, we didn't look at that. Um, 
so obviously your different batteries are packaged in different forms um, and um, you know there's what is it the 18650 type cell type which is pretty popular at the moment mainly because of the the electric car industry um, seems to be the one that people are mostly using it's really what they're using at the moment it's not really the best way of doing it who knows I mean there's other ones too where it's in a pouch as well too where you can get better um, cooling abilities across the uh, across the cell as well too so um, no we didn't look at that My, do you think it's highly likely or do you think it's 50-50? Uh, my, uh, my personal opinion, and this is obviously not Cyrus, I think it's probably, it's probably unlikely. Things are moving pretty rapidly, um, mainly because people are really good with marketing, I think, and unfortunately they're going to get out there, products are going to be installed and, yeah. But, you know, it doesn't mean we can't try and educate people, and that's one of the key things we need to do is to try and educate people about these things so that they're not gullible and say, OK, this is what you need to consider, and that's what some of the stuff that we did. Did you want Yeah. Oh, that's plenty of questions. <laughs> um, you noted up there that the recycling is uh, for lithium and nickel-based is coloured red. Um, I'm a battery recycler. And yes. Well aware. In your comments there because, I mean, for example, there's a nickel based uh, in country recycler, um, and there is a defined pathway for lithium iron technology as well. Yes, it requires an export permit, and we don't just store it in a warehouse somewhere. We do take a lot of effort to make sure. Yeah, oh, I, look, I generalise that, uh, I admit that. Yeah, but yeah, but um, <laughs> I'm surprised to see that that's coloured red. I mean, certainly it needs to be edu education and mm. process. Are you making money from that at the moment, though? Am I making money from it? Yes. Okay. It just there need to be an in-country processor for a lithium ion technology long-term, absolutely, yes. Probably we would, yeah, the definitely. The of the volume are an yeah. important issue. But yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it, is there a defined pathway? Absolutely, yes. I'm just, I'm just questioning the sort of the veracity of the comment that uh, there's none there. Thank you. We'll take that on board. <laughs> Wait, one more question, I think. Yes. If you uh, were to make a choice today between the two uh, uses of uh, batteries, which battery technology would you pick for, say, two kilowatts? <laughs> where, are you, where are you located? Are you in the middle of Australia? Are you in Tasmania? I'm thinking of an experiment in Brisbane. In Brisbane. Um, Oh, it really depends on what you've got. Like, it really depends on what type of load profile you have, um, if the thing's actually going to be in the shade or if it's going to be out in the sun. Um, these are some of the things you need to consider when actually installing these particular systems. It's not just a, oh, yeah, that one there will do. Um, these are some of the things you need to think about. Um, it's not straightforward. I mean, I have my own personal opinion what it might be, um, but, you know, is that the right one? Who knows? It's very unsure at this stage. I should mention that CSO are actually, actually trying to develop some tools to allow. Um, so yeah, so some of the research that we're also doing outside of this particular project is we're trying to work out um, how does the performance of that particular technology go for a particular load profile, for a particular chemistry type, how well does it actually go. Um, we're actually developing some software tools to allow um, informed decisions about what is the best chemistry used for a particular location. So that's some of the stuff that we're doing and that looks at long-term performance of the particular systems and that can be used for domestic all the way up to really large scale installations. Um, it's very important especially when you've got like, you know, you're going to go and pay five million bucks for some utilities type sort of system that's really important to know that. So, yeah, talk to me after line. Yeah. All right. Nice. Hard off questions just there and maybe come up to Sam after the session and have a chat. So. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
So um, a couple of points there on uh, how fast the industry can, can develop, and um, we've certainly been very close to that over the last couple of years. Um, as of lunchtime today, all the material which Sam was talking on is available on our website. Um, so if you go to our website, you'll be able to find the main report that Sam presented on, the um, exact summary to the report, our, our fact sheet is downloadable. Um, there's the consumer facing component there as well, the consumer Q and A's, which is a, a question and answer format. And the checklist on the back of the fact sheet is also download downloadable from, from that site as well. So it's all publicly available and um, we want the industry to absorb it and uh, take a look at what the recommendations and how we move forward. Um, so industry integrity is obviously a very key part of what we do with the CC internally and um, obviously the solar industry has been our focus for a long time. Um, we've been, we have a team of uh, four accreditation experts and in installers themselves and uh, are experts in the field in solar installation but um, recently that effort has turned towards storage as well. So alongside the CSRO work we've been running our, um, our storage industry roadmap in the background as well. So while the FPDI project started in 2013 from its concept and through to execution now, um, about a year later we conceived the, the need for the storage integrity, storage industry roadmap. And a key component of that is of course integrity, installation integrity. Um, so in the background we've been doing all this work that uh, really hasn't come out publicly yet and uh, this week's really the first time we're doing that. <coughs> And, and um, we've got uh, Sandy Atkins here, who's our accreditation manager, who's much more closer to the detail than, than me, and uh, he's going to present next on some of the work that's happening in with regards to storage and the, the working groups and the, the actions, the next steps, and um, yeah, really the outcomes of what's been probably six months to a year worth of work, Sandy in the background. So. <laughs> 